Hello and welcome to Premier Advisor Live. I'm Tommy Ratliff, Senior Associate of Government Affairs at Premier. Today's Advisor Live webinar will focus on drug shortages and the Mitigating Emergency Drugs or MEDS Act. In this Advisor Live, Dwayne Pearson, VP of Advocacy at Premier, and Shomi Saha, Senior Director, Director of Advocacy at Premier, will walk us through an overview of drug shortages, corresponding congressional action, before providing a deep dive of the MEDS Act. We are recording today's presentation. You'll be able to watch the recording by visiting the newsroom section of premierinc.com later this week or on the Premier News and Announcements Premier Connect community. We will also notify you via email once the recording is available for viewing. We've set aside an hour for today's webinar and we'll be taking your questions at the conclusion of the program. You can submit a question at any time by using the questions and answers space on the left-hand side of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the program. It's now my pleasure to introduce the two presenters for today's presentation. Dwayne and Shomi, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Tommy. So from an agenda perspective today, we are going to start with an overview, overview of drug shortages and the progress to date by both the FDA and Congress. We will then deep dive the provisions of the legislation and the rationale behind each of the provisions. Duane will then jump in and discuss where we are and its current status in the 116th Congress. We'll then talk about stakeholder engagement and how each of you can get involved in supporting the legislation. And of course, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So before we get started, we wanted to talk a little bit about Premier's approach to eliminating drug shortages. And in general, Premier believes that a holistic, multi-stakeholder, and interagency approach is necessary to truly address drug shortages. And when we think about sustainable solutions to address, to address drug shortages, we look at solutions that decrease barriers to entry for manufacturers to enter the marketplace, specifically the time and cost to enter the marketplace, but also recognize that there is a need to maintain the quality and safety of the product. So at the end of the day, our goal is to eliminate drug shortages. So I would also like to say that today, the legislation that we're discussing has not been introduced yet, and it is still pending technical assistance by the FDA, which is actually anticipated to be received tomorrow. So while we don't anticipate that any of the major provisions that we're discussing today will change, there may be some technical edits to the legislation itself um, and some nuances that may be addressed, but the information that we're sharing with you is accurate as of this moment, although it's not technically final yet until we see the bill introduced. So, Let's move on to the agenda and start talking about where we are with drug shortages and progress to date. So the key here is that drug shortages really are an invisible epidemic. And over the past several years, drug shortages have continued to grow in number and intensity. And what we had seen after the initial spike in drug shortages from about 2010 to 2012 was that there was a decline, but starting at the end of 2017, there's really been a spike in drug shortages again. But moreover, what's more concerning is that it's not necessarily the number of drug shortages, it's the intensity of the shortages that we're seeing, with multiple shortages lasting over five years. So with that being said, what we at Premier embarked on last year was a root cause analysis of the reasons that shortages occur. So when we looked at the FDA causes of drug shortages, the FDA lists over 50% of drug shortages as unknown. And for us to think through what sustainable solutions to address drug shortages would be, we knew we had to get to the root cause of what these shortages are. So we looked at all of the shortages over the past 10 years and went through what each of those root causes are. And the diagram on the left really highlights each of those causes, including market-based solutions, entry of low-cost competitors, natural disasters, quality and manufacturing issues, recalls, and others. So just as there's no single root cause of drug shortages, there's also no single solution to address drug shortages. 
And that's where when Premier looks at how do we address drug shortages and how do we get to our ultimate goal of eliminating drug shortages, we look at our solutions in three different buckets. So there are the legislative solutions that we're going to be deep diving today. There's also a suite of regulatory recommendations that we're working directly with the FDA and HHS on. And then there's also the need for market-based solutions, and that's where programs like Premier's Provide GX come into play, where we're working directly with manufacturers to provide the long-term predictability and market share that manufacturers need to enter the marketplace for many of these products. So bottom line here is there is no single cause of drug shortages, there's no single solution to drug shortages, and in order to solve this issue, we really need to be flexible, dynamic, and multifactorial in how we look at solving it. So let's take a look at the numbers. So drug shortages are a major driver of skyrocketing costs, contributing to over half a billion dollars in increased healthcare expenditures annually. So how do we know this? So there are several studies that have looked at the, how the prices of drugs increase during a shortage. And we know that that is about $230 million per year, and the average drug in shortage doubles in price. We also know that hospitals and health systems incur increased labor costs associated with managing drug shortages, and that is quantified at about $216 million per year. Now, what is not well quantified is the impact to patient care and the clinical and economic impact of shortages. Except for one study that in tw looked at the 2014 shortage of norepinephrine and found that patients that presented to an ED with septic shock during that shortage were likely to have an increased mortality rate. So what the FDA did was actually took that study and did an economic analysis on the increased mortality rate and projected that the 2014 shortage of norepinephrine alone cost the U.S. healthcare system $13.7 billion in losses. And that's only from one shortage. We have not done a similar analysis on the multitude of other shortages that have existed since roughly 2010. Why are the numbers so important? Obviously, drug pricing is a topic that likely has an opportunity to see some action this year in a bipartisan manner. And so being able to tie drug shortages into the drug pricing debate is really important from a congressional strategy perspective and also really shows that drug shortages are low-hanging fruit when it comes to addressing the broader drug pricing issue. So um, over the years, Congress has made major bipartisan strides in helping to address drug shortages. Drug shortages from a congressional perspective have always been addressed in a bipartisan manner, and we're obviously hopeful that they will continue to be addressed in a bipartisan manner. So starting in 2011, Congress really started taking a look at shortages by holding a series of congressional hearings. 2011 was when we also saw a pre presidential executive order on drug shortages. 2012 was when Congress passed the first major legislation to address drug shortages. That was FIDASIA that included reporting requirements for manufacturers to report anticipated disruptions in manufacturing or shortages to the FDA. The next year in 2013, Congress enacted the Drug Quality and Safety Act, which included track and trace requirements to address the gray market during shortages. And then in 2017, during the most recent User Fee Act negotiations, Congress enacted provisions known as the Competitive Generic Therapy Pathway, which prioritized review of generic medications with less than three manufacturers because FDA research has demonstrated that three is the magical number for generic drugs, and three is what really creates a stable marketplace for generic drugs and creates um, a market that is less susceptible to shortages when you have three or more manufacturers, and it's less susceptible to price spikes when you have three or more manufacturers. 
And then just in 2018, as a result of the C2 injectable shortages that we started to see at the end of 2017, Congress actually got involved with calling both the FDA and the DEA and having them communicate with one another to help address the shortages of those injectable opioids and reallocate C2 quota um, to able manufacturers who could manufacture those products. And then the FDA has also not been shy with the action to date. So in July of 2018, the FDA created an interagency drug shortage task force that while led by FDA also includes other entities from HHS such as CMS, the VA, the DOD, the FTC, FEMA, and others who are working together to develop a robust um, set of recommendations for how drug shortages could be mitigated. And this task force held a series of listening sessions with stakeholders during the fall of 2018. And then right after Thanksgiving in 2018, held a public hearing and also had an open docket that closed in January. This task force is expected to submit their formal report to Congress in December of 2019. And a question that we are often asked is, why, are, why is Congress acting on legislation to address drug shortages now, and why are they not waiting until the December 2019 report from this task force? Well, the reason is that we are going to be going into an election year very quickly. And the reality of the political environment is, is that if something is not addressed by December 2019, it's highly likely that we will see any action in 2020 because of the election cycle. So waiting until December of 29 to receive these recommendations and act on them is too late. So that's why Congress is looking at acting now while they still have a window of opportunity to act on something that there is broad bipartisan support for versus waiting for that formal report. Now, Congress will not be acting in silos. They, like I mentioned before, are working with the FDA to get their feedback on the legislation and make sure FDA's feedback is considered before it's formally introduced. So this is still a joint effort with FDA and Congress to get this done. Okay, so let's talk about the legislation itself. So the legislation is referred to as the Mitigating Emergency Drug Shortages Act, or the MEDS Act. We know that everything in this world, and especially in pharmacy and on the Hill, is all about acronyms, and what's a cuter acronym for drug shortages than the MEDS Act? So we're pretty happy with that. But let's talk about where the ideas for this legislation came from. Premier, while we've been helping congressional offices draft and develop this language, we didn't come up with every idea that's in this legislation. This is really a holistic approach where we looked at feedback from a variety of diverse sources, which included what we heard during that November public hearing that the FDA and the Duke Margolis um, public health group put together. We also looked at a September 2018 summit that was jointly held by ASA, ASHP, ASCO, ISMP, and AHA, and the recommendations that came from there. Members of Congress actually also have their own feedback on what they would like to see in possible legislation. We also went through the comments that were received to the FDA drug shortage docket and then also looked at the multitude of white papers and research papers and other literature sources that are out there that had recommendations regarding what potential congressional action may be to help further mitigate drug shortages. So all of these groups had amazing ideas. Not all of them require congressional action, however. So after we looked at the broad buckets of recommendations, we siphoned out those that definitely require congressional action, and that's where the provisions of the legislation came from. So just because something's not included in legislation doesn't mean that it's not being pursued through a regulatory avenue, for example. So let's start talking about what these provisions are. 
Um, so bottom line is that these are the set of provisions that will require congressional action to help eliminate drug shortages once and for all. And so my goal right now is to kind of walk you through each of these provisions, the rationale with how we got there, and what the solution is trying to solve for. So the first major issue is looking at prioritizing review of drug shortage applications and in inspections. So currently, there is no formal pathway to prioritize review of applications or inspections of facilities for shortage drugs. So what this means is that if a manufacturer submits an application for a shortage drug, the FDA, in consultation with the Office of Generic Drugs and the Office of Drug Shortages, tends to promise the manufacturer that they will look at that application sooner rather than later and promises to put it at the top of the pile. But there's actually nothing that forces the FDA to review that sooner or assign an earlier goal date. And that creates some difficulties in a couple different ways. One, the manufacturer doesn't know when that application would be reviewed and approved. So they can't predict and let the external world know when they anticipate being able to bring that, mar that drug to market and when they anticipate being able to help resolve the shortage. So there's a lot of unknown that still occurs. The other thing with inspections is right now, if um, a manufacturer has a new facility that they're building, for example, and the intent of that new facility is to help manufacture and provide additional capacity for shortage drugs, there's no way for the FDA to prioritize inspecting that facility versus other facilities sooner. Also, if a um, quality or manufacturing notice is provided to a manufacturer, a 483 form, currently the FDA has 90 days to reinspect that facility. But if that facility were used for shortage drugs or if um, that 483 meant a downstream impact to shortages, there's no way for the FDA to say, hey, we should prioritize reinspecting that facility in let's say 14 days versus 90 days to help minimize that downstream impact. So that's what this um, provision would do. It would formally create a priority pathway for the review of drug shortage applications and also for facility inspections. A common question about this section is that it also prioritizes review of new drug applications for, shortage, for shortages. And a quick question is always, wait a second, shortages are almost always for generic drugs and we'd be looking at abbreviated new drug applications or ANDAs, why are we concerned about new drug applications? Couple different things here, right? So one is we'll talk a little bit about the DESI drug pathway in a little bit, but DESI drugs require the submission of a new drug application. DESI drugs are often susceptible to shortages, so that's one reason. And two is there's also safety concerns that the FDA has raised that has resulted in the need for a new drug application to be submitted. So a recent example is L-cysteine. It's the product that is used in neonates, typically in NICUs. Um, there is currently no FDA-approved product on the market. The current product is imported into the marketplace and not approved by the FDA. But when a certain manufacturer went to the FDA and tried to submit an ANDA for L-cysteine, the FDA actually said to that manufacturer, no, I need you to submit a new drug application because we have concerns with the amount of aluminum that was in the prior formulation that was FDA approved. So in that scenario, it's an NDA, it's a shortage drug, and we want to be able to see it prioritize the review process. So that is section one. All right, so the next section builds upon what Congress did in 2012. So the FIDASIA Title X reporting requirements do require that manufacturers of a finished dosage form report to the FDA any anticipated disruption in manufacturing that would result in a shortage. What it does not require is manufacturers to report the problem resulting in the shortage, the extent of the shortage, or the expected duration of the shortage. So by not having that information, 
It makes it difficult for healthcare providers to understand the impact of the shortage, and we see a lot of hoarding occur because folks don't know how long the shortage will occur. We also see the FDA hesitant to utilize their regulatory discretion to make things happen like expediting review of applications, et cetera, because they also don't know the true extent of the shortage. Is it going to be two weeks? Is it going to be two years? <coughs> so what we're trying to do here is extend the reporting requirements for manufacturers to include the reporting of the duration, the severity, and the extent of the shortage. The other issue here is that the onus of reporting is only on the finished dose manufacturer. There is no current requirement that manufacturers of active pharmaceutical ingredients report any disruptions in manufacturing or any anticipated shortages. Why is that an issue? So a couple different things here. Currently, over 80% of API is manufactured internationally, primarily in China and India. When we look at the tariffs that are now also being implemented and imposed on some of these foreign countries, there's also risk that the increase in tariffs may result in some of these manufacturers pulling out of the marketplace. And these foreign nations are also working on initiatives like the Blue Sky Initiative in China, where they're really focusing on the amount of emissions that are released by these manufacturing facilities. And there's a potential that a lot of these API manufacturers may shut down. We've also seen several recent shortages come about because of a shortage or quality or manufacturing issue with the API, Valsartan being an obvious recent example of that. So what we want to do is extend all of these FIDASIA reporting requirements to API manufacturers as well also hold them accountable for this upstream reporting so that we can better mitigate and plan and understand the downstream impact to drug shortages. So it expands that onus not only to finish those manufacturers but also to API manufacturers. All right, so the next major provision um, works to create a critical drug list. So. There's a lot of thought that went into this provision, a lot of back and forth with external stakeholders and the FDA and what the best approach here is. The problem that we were trying to solve for is that today, while the FDA approves a drug to be manufactured at certain facilities, the FDA does not know in what quantity or percentage that drug is actually manufactured at what facility. So, for example, a manufacturer may be approved to manufacture a certain drug in Puerto Rico, North Carolina, and Iowa. But what the FDA does not know is that actually 100% of that drug is manufactured in Puerto Rico. So, when there is a hurricane coming to Puerto Rico, the FDA can't say, hold on a second, manufacturer, what are you doing to move that product to either North Carolina or Iowa? what are your contingency and redundancy plans, or, oh no, we potentially have a problem here, how can we mitigate this potential shortage that might be forthcoming if the site goes down? So initially, this started out with the thought that all manufacturers should report to the FDA exactly where they are manufacturing what. And that kind of came back and after we talked through it with stakeholders, we recognized that part of what is manufactured where is commercial and confidential to the manufacturer as part of their manufacturing process, so we needed to respect that. We also recognized that the FDA didn't necessarily want to know this for every single drug that was out there, that it would be an overwhelming amount of information for the FDA. And so that's where this concept of a critical drug list came from. So what the legislation would do is require the Secretary of HHS, in collaboration with stakeholders who represent pharmacy providers, manufacturers, patients, and others, to compile a list of critical drugs. For these critical drugs, and these critical drugs only, a manufacturer would have to report to the FDA exactly where that is being manufactured 
in addition to the redundancy and contingency plans. So this list would be inward facing. It is not a public facing list. It would be used by the FDA and FDA only in situations where we're looking at natural disasters, for example, and also in situations where the FDA is potentially looking at shutting down a facility or shutting down a line to take into account what that downward impact would be to those critical drugs and to make sure that they're working with the manufacturer to implement one of those redundancy and contingency plans to help ensure uninterrupted supply of product. This section would also require that um, FDA release guidance regarding the criteria to determine what a critical drug list is, um, how the public and other stakeholders can comment on what the critical drug should be, and how that list would be updated at least annually to account for any innovation that occurs. So, this was one of those provisions that started really broad and then became more narrow as we talked through with external stakeholders and FDA how this could really be operationalized. All right, so the next provision looks at expanding the FDA drug shortage list. I think everybody knows that there's two drug shortage lists out there. There's one maintained by the FDA and there's one maintained by the ASHP. And the reality is, is that the FDA criteria is much narrower. It does not currently take into account regional shortages or shortages that are based on excipient strength or dosage form. And this creates challenges for practitioners in rural environments. It also creates barriers to being able to use interim solutions like 503B compounding because if it's not on the FDA drug shortage list, you can't evoke the 503B pathway as an interim solution. It also creates challenges for 340B covered entities because in order to purchase a product outside of the 340B program, it needs to be on the FDA drug shortage list for the most part. So the big ask here is, hey FDA, let's expand the criteria you use to be more akin to the ASHP drug shortage list to account for those regional shortages and dosage form excipient and strength. Um, this also permits the secretary in guidance to further expand the criteria for the FDA drug shortage list so that it wouldn't have to come back to Congress to act on it in the future. It also gives that secretary that future opportunity to expand it as needed. All right. So this next one is all about strengthening intra-agency coordination. So historically, we haven't seen a ton of coordination, and there's definitely been silos, not only within the FDA itself, but within the broader HHS as well. So a couple examples here. If you look at the C2 injectable opioid shortages that started at the end of 2017 and really continued through the majority of 2018, and we're still seeing some issues with products like morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, um, what really happened was the FDA and DEA were not communicating with one another. FDA knew there was a shortage. DEA was not really understanding that we were talking about injectable opioids that are used in hospitals under really strict circumstances, that these were not the tablets or the street drugs that are causing the opioid um, epidemic that we're seeing. And so it took a lot of work and members of Congress weighing in to educate DEA and get the two entities to talk and to finally increase allocations to manufacturers that were able to manufacture the product. Another example is during Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. There was almost no communication between the FDA and FEMA, and so while FEMA was very focused on making sure that hospitals came up first in Puerto Rico, as they should be, they were not focused on making sure that several of the manufacturers that were located in Puerto Rico and were hit very hard were also part of that initial effort to get them back up and standing because of the downstream impact to shortages. And even within the FDA, we've seen silos where the Office of Generic Drugs and the Office of uh, drug shortages may not be communicating, or the Office of Regulatory Affairs, which performs inspections, which shut down a facility without understanding the true downstream impact and trying to get some contingency plans in place. 
So this provision would require the Secretary of HHS to strengthen that intra-agency coordination amongst the agencies within HHS as well as within the FDA as well. All right, we're almost there, guys. So the next provision looks at the DESI pathway. So these are the drugs that are post-1938 and pre-1963. They were proven safe, but they were never proven efficacious. So in order for a new manufacturer to come to market for these drugs, you do have to file a new drug application as well as perform randomized controlled trials to demonstrate efficacy. I think we all know that RCTs are a very expensive and onerous uh, process. And typically what we see with these DESI drugs is tremendous price spikes because of the cost associated with entering the marketplace. And they're also very susceptible to shortages because the DESI pathway does require that all current products that are on the market must exit the marketplace when someone proves efficacy. Um, so there is an entire suite of regulatory recommendations to address the DESI pathway, but the one legislative fix is expanding the evidentiary standards that can be utilized to demonstrate efficacy to also include real-world evidence. The thought process here is that real-world evidence exists for products that have been around for the past 50 to 100 years, and we should be able to capitalize on them, and that demonstrating efficacy with real-world evidence should be a less expensive and onerous process thereby hopefully minimizing the price spikes that we see and would also permit additional manufacturers to come to market sooner so that sole manufacturer that we see currently um, would be minimized. Okay, this next provision is actually a request that came from members of Congress and the goal is to figure out how we can provide consumer notification of shortages. And the request materialized because of recent shortages like Valsartan or the EpiPen shortages, where members of Congress were having constituents go to the pharmacy counter and not know about a shortage until it was too late, or they were seeing the tremendous price spikes associated with these shortages and were raising those concerns with their members of Congress. And so we thought through this a lot and you know, went through a lot of different scenarios, such as, do consumers need to know about all drug shortages? Do they really need to know about an inpatient or acute shortage when there is a therapeutic alternative that's available? Should we limit consumer notification to more of the outpatient drugs? Um, could we develop a scenario that was similar to how recalls are handled by the FDA, where you have five different levels and depending upon the level it's a different type of notification that needs to go to different outlets. We weren't sure and we were also concerned that any consumer notification may result in hoarding by patients of these drugs and we were also concerned that if patients knew a drug was in shortage that even worse they'd start rationing their drugs um, which would also result in a lot of downstream patient impact, right? So no one had the perfect solution. So here, what this provision would ask is for the secretary to develop a report with recommendations on how to improve notification of shortages to consumers, but it also includes notification to physicians, pharmacists, and other healthcare providers who can dispense or administer, who can dispense, administer, or prescribe drugs. Um, because not all pharmacists or providers even know of shortages. And so we recognize this isn't just about consumer notification, it's about making sure that healthcare professionals are also aware of what is or is not in shortage until it's too late. And then finally, um, last but not least, we have to talk about incentives. So I mentioned before that there are some market-based incentives to convince a manufacturer to enter the market for some of these shortage drugs, and that's a lot of what Premier is doing with their Provide GX subsidiary. But there's currently no legislative or regulatory incentive for a manufacturer to enter the marketplace for a drug that's in shortage or a drug that is going to be on the critical drug list that we are proposing be developed as part of this legislation. And we kind of thought through this a lot 
And initially the thought was, well, hey, let's just go ahead and either reduce or waive the user fee um, fees for applicants for drugs of critical or shortages. And then we're like, wait a second, there may be some bad actors out there that would purposely wait until a drug is in shortage to take advantage of the lowered or you know, waived fees. Then there was this concept of what if there was a reimbursement mechanism? So after somebody entered the marketplace and they demonstrated being able to supply a stable and quality supply of said drug over a certain period of time that the FDA could reimburse the manufacturer the user fees. But then we couldn't figure out how the government would reimburse a private entity these type of fees. And so the bottom line is no one knew what the perfect incentives were for this area. And so what we're asking here is that the secretary of HHS create market-based solutions or recommendations for how you incentivize manufacturers to enter the marketplace for drugs that are in shortage and drugs that are on the critical drug list, both areas where there's typically a very low return on investment for these products. And in addition, we recognize the concern with the reliance on foreign manufacturing of API. So we also needed to create a mechanism to incentivize the onshore manufacturing of API. And that this report would also look at how we incentivize that onshore manufacturing of API and how we bring jobs back to the U.S. The intent of this report is that it would actually go to the negotiating table for the next iteration of the User Fee Act negotiations, which kick off next year. The goal with this going there is that it would allow an opportunity for the FDA, for Congress, for the manufacturing industry, and for the public to weigh in on these incentives and what may or may not be considered appropriate, um, and that for that to be considered as part of the PDUFA gadufa negotiations. So we didn't want to wait to get the thought process started on this. We thought it was important that as part of this legislation, the secretary and others are start, starting to think about what those incentives are because we know that these are issues that we need to address and hence the need for trying to include that in the legislation today. So those are all of the provisions in a nutshell. I'm gonna flip things over to Duane right now to talk about where we are this Congress and what this means from a political perspective. Wow, well, thank you, Shomi. I know it's a lot to, to digest. It's a lot of good information. And you know, as Shomi noted, Premier has been active on this issue for nearly 10 years and we've been engaging on many fronts. And in the last couple of years, working with you, our members, we've had great success with FDA to address many of the challenges facing these issues. But in this particular um, challenge that we see here, we do need a statutory fix. So what's the first step? The first step is, as Congress was diving into the drug pricing issue this year, we grew a little concerned as we watched the debate go around just pricing. And they didn't, and one of the things that was missing was the challenges many of you have in having accessibility to these vital workhorse drugs. So we went out and we worked on a plan. Well, I should say we. I should, Shomi's done a great job of working with um, internal as well as some external groups to put together a sound policy that, turned into, that turns into this legislation. And we, were, we went out to find our champions. Well, what better place to find two champions that we have currently right now in Senator Susan Collins from Maine, who, by the way, sits on the HELP Committee, is the chairwoman of the Special Aging Committee, as well as sits on appropriations, and has been a loud voice on addressing many of the challenges we see in the healthcare community, particularly around drug shortages. And then Tina Smith from Minnesota also sits on the Health Committee and has been very vocal on this issue and, and recognizes the challenges many of y'all face. So they are now the faces of this bill. And so what we're doing now is working very closely with them to educate, particularly as we come to a crucial point in the year. The Senate has sped through many drug hearings and the two key committees, the Health Committee and the Finance Committee, are done with their hearing process. They are now moving into getting ready for markup. 
So what does that mean? Well, that means we are in a timeline crunch over the next month to really push this much needed legislation into a vehicle. You might ask, well, what's the vehicle? It's the Health Committee's cost and transparency package. There is section two, title two, this is where this fits in. Um, so the background here is what's been going on behind the scenes. So over the last month and a half, we've met with 16 members on the Finance Committee, 12 members on the Help Committee, nine members on the Special Aging Committee, and we have went in and briefed them all and talked to them on the urgency of this matter, and they all recognized it. And as we talked to them, a lot of what captures their, their attention is, you know, they think back to the challenges of last year. And we looked at, you know, when, when the hurricane hit through Puerto Rico, and the, Puerto Rico and the saline solution was a, a challenge. The injectable opioids were a challenge when one manufacturer went down and 50% of the base was now absent. How do we get that for, for these emergency surgeries or planned surgeries? So they all became on board. And as we talked to them, they saw the public health need for this because they needed to have an understanding of where the challenges are. So long story short, we have a lot of interest in Congress to move this, a lot of support. This bill we do expect to be introduced very shortly. I talked about the package being the health package. Um, what we recognize, it's been through the committee staff with our champions. They've talked and walked through it. We are looking at a very strong opportunity us being included in the package. The markup will come after the 4th of July, and then the floor, it would move to the floor and at the same time, Finance Committee will be moving its package. So what we're looking for is just as y'all look at this, and we will continue our communication with you, but I think it's a, it would be great as y'all reach out to your members in the Senate to urge them to recognize the need to address drug shortages at the same time as they look at drug pricing and how it impacts your ability to treat the patients that you serve in your local communities. Um, and we, we will be keeping in touch with you through our grassroots efforts and our communications on where we are. But um, this is something that we do expect to move pretty quickly with the package. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, so before I get to stakeholder engagement, I think, you know, to Dwayne's point, the reason that we are sharing this information and deep diving it with you before the bill's even been introduced is because of how quickly we anticipate things will move upon introduction. And so we really want to provide as much time as possible for folks to really vet this information and to truly understand what it would do and to go through the process that you have within your organization to be able to officially or formally support something because the bottom line is that we need your help and we need broad stakeholder support to help ensure the legislation success. So what we are looking at is, in regards to your help, we are going to be starting to circulate a joint sign-on letter that looks um, that will be addressed to Senator Collins and to Senator Tina Smith, thanking them for their um, introduction of this legislation and supporting the provisions that are in it to help mitigate drug shortages. We anticipate circulating that letter um, as early as Monday. We just want to confirm that we get that technical assistance back from the FDA tomorrow and confirm that the letter is accurate based upon what the legislation that will be introduced is and mimics that. So we'll be starting that circulation. Question number one is when will the letter close? We anticipate that it will stay open at least through the 4th of July, and the reason for that is we now know that the Senate Help Committee will not be taking up the drug pricing legislation until after 4th of July. But as we get closer to that target, we'll know more about when we can and cannot close that letter. But for now, we anticipate we'll have at least until the 4th of July. And granted, really the 5th of July because no one's going to be in D.C. that week. So that's where we are going to be with the letter. We encourage you to share the letter broadly. It's not limited to just the folks that we email. It is a broad stakeholder letter. So obviously encourage folks to send that out. 
Now, part of that is that we also need your help to educate your leadership on what we're talking about today. No one understands the pains of drug shortages more than pharmacy. And so um, as members of pharmacy and as providers in healthcare systems, we really need you to help elevate why drug shortages are such an issue and how this legislation like this is going to help in the end of the day. Premier also works very closely with the Government Affairs Network, which includes um, the Government Affairs teams from our major members. So we're also going to be working with the GAN to educate them about this legislation as well and hopefully get their support. So as folks are in D.C., and as Dwayne mentioned, as you're meeting with key stakeholders, please put a plug in for why shortage legislation is so important that it's included as part of the pricing package. Um, and then just your thought leadership in general. Um, you know, if you come across any opportunities with speaking engagements or media or anything where you think there's an opportunity to share how drug shortage legislation could be helpful, please, you know, move forward and please consider Premier as a resource in how we can help position you or assist you with any materials that you may need. Um, so that's kind of where we are today as far as needing your help to move this forward. Um, look for that joint sign-on letter. Part of the joint sign-on letter is yes, we will also share the language to date as well as a section-by-section -section summary so you're not going into this blind and you have an opportunity to formally review everything. So with that, at this time, we'd love to open it up for Q&A. And I'll turn it back to Tommy. Great. Thank you, Shomi. And uh, Seguin, uh, if you could open up the line, please, and uh, provide instructions for our participants if they have any questions over the phone. Certainly. If you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 new telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. One moment, please, for the first question. Great. And as a reminder to all of our participants, you can also submit your questions through the question and answers area on your webinar home screen. It uh, should be to the left of the presentation. And we'll hold for a moment to see. Right now we don't have any questions online, and so we'll wait to see if any come through uh, via telephone or over the webinar. As a reminder, to register for a question, press the 1 4. There seems to be no questions at this time, sir. Great. Thank you. Well, I think with that, we've come to the end of our time today. We hope the program has been helpful and we appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. The contact information for our speakers is showing now on the screen. Uh, if you have any additional questions or feedback about today's event, uh, please feel free to reach out. And we also ask that you'll take a moment to answer the brief survey questions at the uh, end of our presentation and let us know how we can better serve you. Additionally, we will have today's recording posted very soon on the newsroom section of premierinc.com and we'll send an email whenever that recording is ready. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.